Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this presentation. Renolution, that's uh, the name we've chosen for our short, mid and long-term strategic plan this time. This is one world which is already part of our organization's lang, able to grasp the degree of transformation we consider necessary, while stating our belief that uh, we will build it with our own style, leveraging the know-how, the assets, and the culture of this 122 years old company. We knew we needed a new storyline which with a new direction, a plan with uh, solid and credible numbers. But we also felt that playing a new game would require a profound organizational change, putting our top managers and top leaders in the right positions on the field, giving them and their themes a new set of objectives and motivating them with a different reward system. This is part of uh, what we have done in the last six months, and this is what you, we are going to present you in the next uh, 90, 100 minutes. But if you want me to boil it down to just one simple slogan, it will be moving our focus from volume to value. I took the time to go pretty deep in the system to meet the people, see the problems, the challenges, but also identify the strengths and scouting for opportunities. I visited plants, dealers, design and engineering centers in France, in Romania, in Russia, in Spain, in Turkey, in Morocco many different situations and issues, but one common denominator, the entire system was tuned to grow in volumes. Now, I would never dare to say that the approach was wrong. It might have been appropriate five, 10 or 15 years ago, but it clearly failed in the recent past. Otherwise, we would not be in the situation we are in today. It is like a car growing in size and weight becoming too heavy for the output of the engine. And this becomes very obvious when the latest Grand Prix are raced on more and more twisty circuits. Let's start by celebrating the good things that we inherit from the past. Ten years ago, we started amongst the first in the world with electric cars. We have a long experience on this value chain. And by the way, just to remind everybody, we are the volume leaders in this segment, at least in Europe. 20 years ago, we engaged and proved that the global low-cost car was possible and sustainable. We have sold over 14 million vehicles in the meantime, everywhere. We have built a double-digit direct cost advantage compared to our competitors while being profitable. This is very difficult to replicate. Almost 100 years ago, we created our retail finance branch, and now we have a clear overperformer with RCI, sporting best-in-class levels in profitability, resilience, and customer satisfaction. And then, of course, for the past 20 years, we have been members of the Alliance, which is one of our key strengths today. Not for the scale, like everyone keeps repeating to me uh, inside and outside, but for the potential and especially for the rich. The rich in terms of product, ranging from Japanese small K-car to two-ton pickups. Uh, this scope potentially gives the three groups the chance to tap into 70% of the global profit pools and virtually any market on the planet. Rich in terms of technology, with the three members' company engineering teams, this enables us to handle any current and future technology available and relevant in the automotive industry. Rich in terms of business, exchanges of technology and more between alliance companies generated over 35 billion euros in the past four years. Without forgetting that, Every year, our common purchasing platform called APO is processing more than 100 billion worth of trade. 
On the negative side of the equation, two variables. First, the immoderate quest for volume. And second, a non-resolved approach to market and brand portfolio management. The company had one objective you certainly remember, exceed 5 million units sold by 2022. And it strived to get there. We built a manufacturing capacity fit for this target. We increased our R&D capex by 65% in four years. And we reached at peak in 2019 only 3.6 million vehicles produced. The result is that our return on capital employed, the ROSI, was lowered by 50% between 2015 and 2019. Our break-even point grew 15 points above where it should have been before. All of this before the COVID. So we grew bigger, but not better. We also grew wider worldwide, still not better. We targeted volume pools, not profit pools. Outside of Europe, mainly in emerging low-profile markets and segments. After a decade of expanding our geographies, we sell cars in over 130 countries. But Europe still concentrates three-quarters of our profit. In fact, it may surprise you to learn that five European countries generate half of our profit. So expanding to over 100 countries has only brought us 25% of our margin. Expanding globally frequently brings also product diversity and complexity, and it happened to us too. Almost half of our lineup is made of region-specific models with suboptimal volumes. And we were not particularly disciplined with complexity in product development. So by counting the number of parts entering on average in each single plant, independently from the model, we realized that we were 20% above benchmark. Now, talking about brand portfolio management, we see, you see here that we ended up with our two main brands selling cars in the same price ranges. On the right side, you see another symptom of the volume mantra. In Europe, Renault is well positioned in terms of pricing compared with other mainstream players, but when we went global, we looked for the easiest way to gain market share, selling entry-level cars. And my experience says that strong global brands have a homogeneous position across the markets. Now, let's look at the opportunities that we have. Over two-thirds of our sales are made in the B segment, when the C segment profit pool weighs three times more. And it brings an average of 30% additional operational margin per car. When you compare our operational performance in the last five years with our benchmark, half of the difference is here. We lost ground on the C-segment in the most traditional European markets. It is as simple as this. I am seeing, seeing the C-segment as a lost opportunity because we are talking about something we know how to do in, in segments where our customers are expecting us to be competitive. We did it back in the 90s, I remember, with the Megan family. Only we have not been able to replicate it since. In conclusion, the diagnostic is pretty cut and dry. Now we know what we have to do, and we have already started doing it as a team in the past six months. Reduce our break-even point, reduce unnecessary diversity and complexity, focus our investment on more profitable pr products, steer our business from market share to margins. This is obviously the first part of the game. Now let's look at how we have organized the work and how we look beyond just fixing the basics. I would like to take the chance to underline that this plan is not just a wish list. It is the sum of actions we have already decided and organized, and for some, already up and running. We have three phases within a horizon that looks beyond the classical five years of a plan. It goes from simply surviving the storm to putting the company in a better shape it's never been before. First phase is resurrection, running from 2020 to 2023. It will be clearly about cost reduction, margin, and cash generation. We are already totally in this phase. All efforts are focused on restoring our competitiveness today, which leads us to the second phase 
called renovation, spanning from 2023 to 2025. This is when we will benefit from a completely new and revamped lineup, electric and electrified, centered on larger profit pools and allowing us to finally leverage a portfolio of strong and differentiated brands. And then third phase is revolution. From 2025 on onwards, traditional OEMs will have to jump on the value chain of new mobility. Customer expectations are wider and different. It's about becoming a player in the data, energy and services. We are getting organized to make the Renault Group a front-runner in this race, scouting as of today for opportunities to make this company less dependent on traditional businesses. These phases have different endpoints, but it is important for me to say that for all three phases, the work is already underway as of today. I will now briefly hand over to Clotilde for a snapshot of our turnaround roadmap. Clotilde. New ambitions call for a new compass. Indeed, we're also changing the way we measure our performance. We no longer talk about market shares, sales and synergy records. We talk about profit, cash and investment effectiveness. In the construction of the plant, we went for cautious volume and flat market shares and assumed markets would return to pre-crisis level by 2023 in most emerging markets and beyond 2025 in Europe. Any outstanding success of a product, any unanticipated rebound of a market, any opportunity to partner in order to synergize investments that might happen along the way will just come on top of these numbers. We commit by 2023 to reach more than 3% group operating margin, accumulate around 3 billion of euro operational free cash flow, and lower our investment around 8% of turnover, moving from double digit to low level industry standard in this phase. We'll get there step by step, but our operating margin will stay penalized by the high level of depreciation and by decreasing R&D capitalization ratio. By 2025, we aim at more than 5% 5 group, 5 group operating margin, around 6 billion of cumulative 2021-2025 auto free cash flow, and a ROSI improved by more than 15 points compared to 2019. That KPI wasn't our focus up until now. It becomes fundamental as we have agreed as a team to be strict on the quality of our investment decision. Now, back to Luca. Thank you, Clotilde. Thank you very much. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, a new game requires a new organization on the field. This is the way it worked before. It's a matrix with at least four dimensions, too many layers, too many people on the same ball, too many shared responsibilities, too many silos, and a go-to-market going through the regions. With an underlying assumption that all that matter were size and volumes. Now, let's look at the way we are working since 1st of January 2021. It is simpler, it's flatter, with one, sometimes two layers less. It's not a matrix, it's a flow. I like to think about it like a four-wheel drive car. The two front wheels pulling are the brands. The two rear wheels pushing are the different function and engineering first. Everything well anchored on the strong alliance platform. In the new structure, the brands are clearly in the driver's seat. They're responsible for margins, ROSI, and customer satisfaction. They pull the organization towards targeted customer and markets. Engineering faces directly the brands that for the business and has full responsibility on timing, cost, and performance of product development. Everybody else is there uh, to ensure the connection between the front and the real uh, wheels works smoothly. And every piece is in the daring and caring hands of experienced, credible, and passionate leaders. I think it will do the job and uh, give us the necessary support to face the huge challenge we have in front of us. 
Now, let's look first at how the functions will contribute to the plan, beginning with engineering. Here, Gilles Le Borne gave three priorities to the team, efficiency, speed, and value for the customer. Efficiency means, first, that we are streamlining by 30% the engineering organization through optimized outsourcing, digitalization, and, and reduction of GNA. We invest in new tools, for example, to divide the prototype cost by almost two. Uh, we smartly re redistribute workload amongst the different global engineering centers to reduce engineering rates. We already see a decrease of over 20% in R&D net uh, expenses in 2020 compared to 2019. We have also reorganized the product development process to increase our uh, pace and speed. So this modernized lean organization will allow us to reduce by a whole year uh, our car development time from concept freeze to start of production. That's about 25% of the development time uh, saved. New models to be launched on existing platforms will be in the market in less than three years from now on. After speed diversity reduction has been uh, our battle in the last month. Behind all our launches, there will be a 30% reduction of complexity from platforms to powertrain down to components without losing coverage neither on markets nor on profit pools, on the contrary. The alliance reach uh, in technology will further boost our efficiency. We can proudly show that with the product strategy, we will uh, be able to produce an unprecedented 80% of vehicles on just three Alliance platforms. We'll be efficient, we'll be flexible, and those platforms being EV dedicated and multi-energy and covering all segments from A to D. So when people question me whether the Alliance is working operational, I'll just show them this chart. Along with Nissan and Mitsubishi volumes, those three platforms will accumulate over 6 million vehicles per year across the Alliance. So when it comes to scale, that puts us in the finals of Champions League compared to other automotive groups. And that's more than we have ever, ever done. Along, along with the platforms, we uh, agreed on one of the most extreme powertrain rationalization exercises in the automotive industry. I know you are thinking that going ever greener comes at a growing cost. Yes, powertrain will cost up to 2.5 times more in the next years with a direct effect on pricing. But over the same 10 year period, our pure electric powertrain cost will be divided by two. The other good news is that for us, it has been already all invested. Energy mix-wise, we will be able to smartly leverage our legacy technology and invest in a future where we see Renault as one of the most progressive uh, OEM in this direction. And it goes like this. We'll have fewer powertrains, equipping more vehicles, and spanning on a wider horsepower coverage. We will reduce the number of powertrains from eight to four families. But in fact, will only rely on one gasoline powertrain that combined with the E-Tech modular hybrid technology will allow us to cover low, mid and high power and therefore uh, price uh, ranges. So with the set, uh, that set up, I would say we consider that we will pass regulation on ICEs and hit CO2 objectives even beyond 2030 with very limited additional investment as it will be about changing battery size or changing the electric engine. This technology, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the hidden gems in the house. One family of diesel engine, we have already invested, uh, and will be dedicated to light commercial vehicles for as long as we need. But parallelly, we are working to integrate the most competitive hydrogen technology and adapting the current engines to green fuels. We'll f focus on taking advantage of our scale and experience to push on pure electric platform for small and medium-sized vehicles with same battery module in LFP and NMC chemistry. We are engaging in the future, playing the leader's game when it comes 
to energy transition. Now, the good news, I repeat, is that all investment in hybrid and BEVs are already behind us. Based on this strategy, and according to our modeling, we should be in the position to pass the 2025 regulation gateway. And for the time being, I can confirm that we have made it in 2020, and we are on track to meet 2021. But here is an information that might be interesting for you. We are already generating more contribution margin per pure electric car than per the IC equivalent. In 10 years, we were able to reduce by half the cost of electric powertrain, and we consider that with the next battery generation, 2023 4 uh, non-dilutive pure BVs should be within our reach. For the e-tech hybrid, we aim to reach the cost level of the European market leader in 18 to 24 months. This is uh, our life insurance in the challenging times of powertrain transition, something that puts Renault in a very, very comfortable position. In the same smart way, we want to approach the integration of the key automotive technologies in our vehicles. The message in this chart is, I would say, pretty simple. We will be at best competitive level thanks to the possible sharing within the alliance and thanks to a very open approach to partnerships. I have already mentioned the scale and cost advantage we have on platforms and powertrains. On connected services and onboard AI, I have to admit that I was very convinced about the potential of the partnership with Google in the moment I drove the prototype of the Megane E a few months ago. It is a totally different user experience compared to homemade of or integrated systems by traditional suppliers I have known before. We will develop this partnership further simply because it brings something better than the competition for our customer. When we will be launching that technology as a world premiere on our mid-size EV next year, we will be leading the pack for sure, you will see. On ADAS and autonomous driving, we have made a decision of being fast followers as we don't currently see a clear business case in the markets where we are operating. We will be quickly adopting technology, leveraging the Nissan push, who considers this application as fundamental in their strategy to compete in markets such as China or Japan, where everybody expects adoption will be faster. Now, let's turn to the work and the decision we have made on the industrial side. I suspect not many people know that the Renault Group is already industry benchmark for manufacturing costs per vehicle for the cars we sell in Europe. I would say thanks to a very cost-competitive manufacturing network, including Spain, Turkey, Romania and Morocco. This is a fact. Now, the new strategy we're putting in place will allow us to gain additional 20 points of competitiveness in the next three, four years, giving us an edge on this, I would say, very important KPI. So, what do we plan to do? We'll take our 2022 plan commitments a step further. We'll lower our capacity from 4 million in 2019 down to 3.1 million in 2025. Our plant utilization rate will recover from its 70% level in 2019 to over 100% already in 2023. We are already starting uh, to right-size infrastructure, sell unnecessary assets and surfaces. And obviously, as most of the new products are being developed on existing platforms, they will be there, I would say, to better fill existing capacity. Now, the combination of all those actions, plus the fact that a lot of investment went into the upgrade and automatization of our plants in the last decade, will allow us to have a lean and high-performance operational system on the industrial side. Don't ask me today where exactly we'll take action. We don't want speculation or media buzz to hinder the work that we have planned to do. But believe me, we have a very clear and, and uh, strong uh, ideas and uh, concept on where we want to be in not more than three, four years. But we will do it in the runaway, meaning in the full respect of the expectation 
from the different stakeholders, especially our workforces. We have already started on the reconversion of the historical flan plant, and this for me represents a very good example of our approach. Renolution means also a fundamental rethinking of our go-to-market strategy. Of course, with different starting points and different challenges here and there, but with a common criterion in developing the plan. We'll stay only if we see the potential to make a profit. Let me remind you that even without considering the alliance, Renault became in the last 20 years a true global player. This global footprint is a real asset for the group. Outside uh, Europe, it represents half our sales, two-thirds of our workforces, six design and engineering centers, 16 vehicle production sites. The fact that we didn't reach the profitability we wanted, uh, we wanted doesn't mean that uh, we want to give up on the, our global footprint. On the contrary, it means that we need another approach. We are going to change strategy on the product, right-sizing where necessary, as we've done, for example, recently in Brazil, stop the rush for market share at the expenses of profitability. We'll optimize our operations in Latin America, in India, in Korea. We'll strengthen our competitiveness in Spain, Morocco, Romania, uh, and Turkey, for example. And we'll create more synergies within Russia because we see the, poten the potential for that. All these efforts from all functions will fuel our 2022 cost reduction plan and take it a step further. So let's have a look at the impact on our fixed and our variable cost. We have a visibility to achieve our 2 billion fixed cost reduction objective well ahead of what we have committed to, maybe by the end of 2021. The fixed cost reduction effort is happening everywhere in the company, and even more so, I would say, in engineering, where it is normally more complicated. We'll push it further by 2023 to reach 2.5 billion. We have plans to go further with cost discipline, including, amongst other things, a plan to revise our direct involvement in distribution in markets, including with our own dealers. Um, we think we can achieve over 3 billion by 2025 when the right sizing of our manufacturing footprint will fully kick in, as I have mentioned uh, before. And on the variable cost side, we have new design to cost approach in the product development, a clear cost responsibility to the chief engineers for new projects and to manufacturing for series cars, 30% reduction in diversity, stricter rules of up to 85% on carryover between products, an earlier invo involvement of suppliers in the process. And all of this, I would say, makes us confident that we will be able to achieve a 600 euro re reduction per car at ISO perimeter by 2023, so in two years. I had the chance to meet the CEOs and the leading teams of our top 10 suppliers to challenge together business as usual practices. And I have to say that their response makes me optimistic that we will achieve the targets doing better work from our side, allowing them to plan for the long term and reduce the unnecessary cost generated by our own complexity. I think it's a very healthy base for a new beginning in our relations. And I thank all our suppliers for their commitment because this is one of the areas where we will have to make the difference and we will do it together. All in all, the picture on variable cost will look like this. We anticipate an increase of unique cost due to higher segment mix and especially from the enrichments uh, following the regulations. But this will be true, I think, for everybody. The 600 euro mentioned earlier will only partially compensate it. In addition, by our calculation, the effect of a renewed lineup and the change in market focus, we believe will be able to overcompensate and therefore increase margins. Now the question is, are we able to cover the additional costs coming from regulation? The answer is yes, we can and we will. The combination of cost reduction and our increase in net revenues means a reduction of uh, our break-even point by more than 30% by 2023. 
But please note that in 2021, we will be already able to show a drastic improvement. Now, coming to revenues, uh, let me show you the playbook of our product renovation strategy. We'll regain our legitimate rank in the C and the D segment with a total of 11 electric or hybrid new models pushing the contribution of mid-sized cars to our contribution margin from just 15% in 2019 to 40% in 2025. We'll manage this offensive while maintaining our leading position in the small car segment with five electric or hybrid new models. We will secure our position in the LCV segment with six models of which three pure electric. And most importantly, we will be profitable in all segments. We'll take now a pause, uh, watching a short video, talking about the topic we, we didn't want to omit while building the plan, quality, quality. So let's look at how the revolution will impact this discipline too. Quality is a key topic for any OEM. We normally divide it in three dimensions, reliability, perceived quality, and durability. In the world of shared economy and new mobility, where you sell kilometers rather than in the vehicle, we have a strong motivation to break the classical consumer cycle, which, by the way, all car makers have contributed to create. In this new world of circular economy, we want to reduce amortization on the hardware to lower down the total cost of ownership and offer the possibility to upgrade the product throughout the life cycle. Our battery, now we know, can, least, can last easily 10 years and upgradable software architecture will make this easier. That's why we have engaged on the 1 million kilometer Zoe project and for us it is a symbol of the priority we have set to become the true front runner in the new game you will see the business implication when we will later speak about the mobilized brands. Now, before closing this chapter, let me point out that although I've been talking often about the future, the work has already begun at Renault. And it has been, I can tell you, intense and also fruitful. We appointed Mission One, a dedicated team whose boss sits in the board of management and is surrounded by the best people in the company to focus on the turnaround of the entire organization on cash, revenue, and cost of optimization. We are going much faster on the previous plan commitments on fixed cost reduction, as I mentioned earlier. We have reshuffled all lineup in a matter of weeks. We stopped, I think, seven programs and decided to launch eight new ones. We are already creating value. With the help of our commercial teams, our importers and dealers, we were able in just one quarter to cash back 5.5 points in net pricing. And we expect to go further by the end of 2020 and are determined to sustain this trend in 2021. Something unexpected for many, but an achievement that shows that everybody has rebooted the operating system at Renault. Earlier, I told you about the organization being like a four-wheel drive car with the rear wheels being the function, pushing the performance. 
let's now move on the front wheels, which pull the system towards the customer, the markets, and the business. In other words, the brands. We were speaking earlier about an unresolved approach to brand portfolio management. This is a simple way to represent it. Growing overlap between Renault and Dacia, duplication between Renault Sport and Alpine, no clear customer targeting, no distinctive technology hierarchy, nor timeline in technology allocation amongst the brands. What you see now is the way it is going to work from, from today, supported by dedicated organization. Dacia will stay Dacia, offering accessible products based on proven and affordable technologies targeting smart buyers in any segment where we can provide a solution. The Renault brands will embody modernity to offer solutions in the core of the market. Renault will push the envelope on EV and hybrids, tech and services to attract progress mainstream buyers. And finally, Alpine will move from a kind of nostalgic position to become our tool to play automotive avant-garde. Fully electric, still sporty and exclusive it will give us the chance to start from scratch on all parts of the value chain from engineering to distribution in order to attract passionate early adopters. And then mobilize. Mobilize goes beyond into the field of data, mobility and energy services and will enable us to dive earlier into the new world of mobility, providing solutions and services to other brands and partners but also attracting customers that don't want necessarily to buy vehicles, but merely use them. Now, let's start with Renault. For the Renault brand, we say la nouvelle vague of European automotive. That's the ambition we gave uh, ourselves in a time where a lot of disruptions and discontinuities are giving us the chance to kind of reshuffle the cards. Nouvelle Vague, as you probably know, was the name uh, given to a new film style emerging in France in the 50s uh, and the 60s, challenging the Hollywood mass market dogma. A new way of doing movies, which at that time had uh, actually global influence. And why? Because it offered a smart, cult, soul-filled alternative, and it represented, at that time, modernity in that industry. But what is modernity in the automotive business today? This is the question. But this will also be the role of the Renault brand in the house. Beyond doing what everybody expects an automotive brand to do, that means engineering, producing, distributing, and, of course, servicing, good cars, and modernity is not just about integrating tech in our product, it is also about managing smartly the energy business generated by electric batteries and offer unique uh, services. I will dedicate uh, some minutes to show that we have strong arguments, uh, strong assets and projects that will substantiate this, this ambition we will turn Renault into a tech brand, uh, into a service brand, into an energy brand. We are also putting modernity at the core, and we think that by putting modernity at the core, we will be able to reinvent uh, our footprint in France. We'll have the assets to push the entire French automotive ecosystem on the higher end of the value chain. So let's take a closer look at uh, how we will be competitive in uh, each one of those three fields. First, it's energy, on energy transition especially. We are able now to challenge the leader on the hybrid market with our modular, very competitive technology, the technology we call e-tech. We think that this is one of the best solutions for European driving conditions. It's powerful, it's green, with up to 80% electric driving for an HEV in the city. We are also determined to sustain 
our leadership on EV. First, by leveraging our two EV platforms uh, to create families of product in the C segment, but also in the B segment. Second, by sharing components and especially battery modules, we will be able to develop profitable EVs at the price of combustion uh, engine powered models. You'll be able to see one of them very, very shortly. Finally, by enlarging and converting one of our plants into the biggest EV factory in Europe, we are working on ways to make it in France. Uh, including, for example, the creation of a battery plant with one of our top suppliers. This is what we meant when we were speaking about the Electropole. Finally, we'll also offer market-ready, end-to-end hydrogen solutions for LCVs. We have just uh, signed, as you probably read, an MOU to create a JV with Plug Power. Plug Power is one of the global leaders today. And together, we will design fuel cells LCV based on Renault platform and offer turnkey solution for customer, including vehicle, uh, including refueling station, uh, and also decarbonize hydrogen deliver, the whole chain. We will be based in France, where we will gradually localize the production of the fuel cells. Our objective, in general, is to become European number one in fuel cell LCVs, targeting a market share of about uh, or over 30%. The target is clear for the old Renault brand. The target is to reach the greenest mix in the European market by 2025. Out of the 14 vehicles we'll launch by 2025, seven will be electric, fully electric. All of our new models will have an electric or an hybrid version by 2023. 30% of our sales will be fully electric cars, 35% will be hybrid. We'll be both green, but also is very important, profitable. All our EVs have a better contribution margin than their ICE equivalents. Now, let's uh, talk about coming from hardware to software. So better let's talk about our new approach to software. Uh, an ecosystem that we call the Software République. This ecosystem approach aims at creating world-leading next-generation mobility OEMs and suppliers. Engaged in building European know-how and defending our sovereignty in these uh, key technologies. We will develop joint expertise in user interfaces, big data, service platforms, operating systems, cybersecurity, embedded computers, sensors, actuators, just to name a few. Amongst the founding members of the Software Republic, we can see great companies such as Orange, Atos, Dassault System, and ST Microelectronics, Electronics just uh, as a start. You have to imagine the Software Republic as a giant real-world lab where experiments on connected autonomous cars can be led in a controlled environment in real time. To do so, we will open 100,000 square meters in our facilities to our partners. And in this space, software and other groundbreaking innovation will be developed and will be tested. We will offer proximity to our engineering infrastructure, to our technical skills, and we will include our Renault software factory. In this lab, we will bring a thousand engineers and data scientists, I think the best you can find in the market. These activities will create, I believe, immediate opportunities for the automotive industry, but also for other sectors, such as defense, infrastructures, aerospace, telecoms, electronics, mobility, and of course, also the data industry. The Software Republic will be one of a kind in Europe, and Renault will be one of the founding members. So, how will this translate into our cars? This is Automotive 4.0 Artificial Intelligent Infused. Our cars 
will get better every day as they are driven. Leveraging in-house expertise and uh, our Software Republic ecosystem will offer the best connected high-tech services embedded natively in our vehicles. Let's take a look at how it feels. With our in-house Renault app, we call it My Renault, our customers stay in touch with their cars, control them from their smartphone, and prepare their trips. In 2022, Renault will be introducing MyLink, a new infotainment system with Google built in. It will be the first car maker to bring Google services to mass market cars. With Google Maps, navigation will be personalized based on the car user's frequent destination, including enhanced electric vehicles functionalities. Car users will access their favorite apps on Google Play and control car features hand-free by voice. Our cars will become more intelligent every day. In the future, they will adapt their functionalities proactively to meet the needs of our drivers. Our vehicles will gain value over time. They will be constantly enriched with new features which will be offered to our customer over uh, the air. Megane E will be the first vehicle equipped with MyLink starting in 2022. Now, on top of getting more intelligent, the second characteristic of Renault product is that they will last longer. You have seen our remanufacturing and refurbishing services work with the Zoe uh, just a few minutes ago. We plan to make it a null mark of our brand. This is particularly relevant in the fleet world, and, but also in the mobility world. This approach will have a big and positive impact, for example, on our residual values, but not only. So by taking a fresh, a fresh look at Flan, we actually came to realize that uh, we are the biggest recycler in this country. We have a clear advantage, advantage when it comes to second life and end of life of batteries. Or in other words, a lot of money is available during the life cycle. And the control of this part of the value chain has the potential to fundamentally change the business case of electric cars. At the refactoring plan, we will recondition more than 100,000 used cars per year. We will repurpose diesel light commercial vehicles and convert them into biogas and pure EVs. We will upgrade mobility platform vehicles with new batteries. We will collect used batteries and find them a second life. And this is also why we say that Renault vehicles will actually last longer. I think this is also a strong commitment to sustainability. So now let's conclude the Renault brand section with uh, a classical product uh, planning chart, but actually not a very classical one. And also with the go-to-market strategy before coming with a little surprise today only for your eyes. When you look at the chart in summary, in 2025 we will be launching 14 Renault core vehicles. Seven will be full electric vehicles, seven will be in the C and the D segment. It is a double down on both electrification and mix improvement. In Europe, B segment launches are 100% electric. And because our EVs already today generate a higher contribution margin than their IC equivalents, the segment will remain a pillar of profitability for the group. Our CD segment launches are 100% electrified and will total 45% of our sales mix in 2025. The consequence of this product plan, and I must say taking some cautious assumption on volume and pricing, is that we will increase our 
average price by up to 5,000 euro by 2023 and more than 7,000 by 2025. Speaking about market portfolio management this time, uh, I want to say that for sure we want to stay global, but with a different philosophy. We'll reconquer our position in the C segment in Europe to generate margin first, but we will also focus on more profitable segments and channels in countries such as Russia and Brazil, in India and in South Korea. This is the approach and the strategy. Finally, I, I'd like to say also that once we, have, we would have settled the current challenges that we have in China, we would consider coming back because it's an important country. And when we, but when we do so, we will skip, uh, I think, directly to the next generation, directly to the 6G, if, uh, if you will. We are aiming at uh, being profitable in all markets by 2023. Now, let me finish uh, before leaving the stage to Denis, to Denis Levot, the CEO of Dacia Lada Business Unit. Let me leave you with something showing what uh, revolution means when it comes to product. I know by experience that uh, when you are able to reinvent some cult products of the brand, it lights a fire under the whole brand. This is what we expect with the new Renault 5. It's a pure electric vehicle, but at the price that many, many people will be able to afford. And this is only the beginning for the Renault brand. Hello everyone, I'm happy to present you the brands Dacia and Lada together. In fact, these two brands have a lot in common, and this is why we decided to bring them closer in the organization. Indeed, they both sit on a very cost-competitive technical, industrial, and distribution setup, making each of them a very profitable business. This model is something very difficult to replicate at least for our European competitors. Behind Dacia and Lada's popular lineup lies a unique all-weather business model. First, a frugal and disciplined design-to-cost approach in the product development, leveraging the best technically proven and amortized solutions in the group. Second, a labor cost of less than a quarter of what we see in Western European countries, combined with a very high local integration ratio. All this brought together gives to our cars a double-digit cost advantage versus competition, completed by a very lean distribution model based on low-discount retail sales. Both brands stand for real value for money, and both address the smart buyers, which represent more than 20% of the world global demand. And that is why we sell lots of them. You might know that Lada Granta and Vesa are number one and number two in Russia, you might not know that Dacia Sandero is the most sold nameplate in Europe, if you consider the pure retail market. Duster is the most sold SUV on the same perimeter. These blockbusters show that value for money never goes out of fashion. The idea behind the creation of the business unit is that Dacia and Lada will remain separate companies with their own brands, history and strategy. 
but they will benefit from more dedicated, focused and coordinated governance. More importantly, they will be better integrated within the Renault Group to leverage synergies. Let's see what it means from a technical standpoint. Concretely, we have decided to base both range of product on the very cost-competitive and flexible CMFB platform. We are talking here about more than one million cars per year to be produced in competitive locations, Russia, Romania and Morocco. We will go from four platforms to one, from 18 body types to 11, with up to 85% carry across between the models. And finally, upgrading the substance of the product from a quality and technical standpoint, as this new platform is brand new and recently invested. But now let's talk about the product planning. The idea is also to unleash the potential of Lada and Dacia, making them full-fledged international brands, enabling them to go beyond their current perimeters in terms of markets and segments. The CMFB platform enables us to tap into the C segment with vehicles longer than 4.5 meters, as you will discover in a few seconds. This coverage extension potentially doubles the profit pool we can address. Lada will consolidate its leading position in Russia with state-of-the-art vehicles, therefore not only defending more than 20% market share, but also focusing on share of wallet. And we will not stop at the Russian borders our ambitions are international. Entering the C segment, Dacia will be in the position to increase its average price by a fat 30% thanks to the new product portfolio. Very importantly, it is all starting right now, in 2021, with the launch of the new Sondero. Just Google Sondero and you will see the reaction of the press to this new platform. And continuing very soon with the all-new pure electric Dacia Spring. But what shall we do with the brands? Beyond those products, we have some ideas on how to give a new spirit to Dacia and Lada. Yes, Niva, in two sizes, compact and medium, based on the same CMFB platform. Niva is a cult product, and not only in Russia. It is the Russian automotive proxy of the Swiss Army knife, a technical product for usage in extreme condition, 4x4, high stands, short gears, and robust construction. We all know that any Russian family has a story to tell about the Niva, like any French family with Renault. Furthermore, we think this product have a space beyond the Russian market, as they've always had. So besides the complete renewal of the mainstream range, the relaunch of the Niva will enable the complete repositioning of Lada as a brand. And now Dacia. Shall I say tout simplement? Dacia will stay Dacia, always offering the best value for money proposition in all segments we play in. But we want to bring the brand to higher grounds. Take a look at this.
This is the new C-segment SUV by Dacia, the Bigster concept car. 4.6 meter long on the cost structure of a B-segment car, and it can be fitted with alternative or hybrid powertrains for compliance with cafe or local regulations. As a conclusion, our strategy for the two brand consists in four pillars. Maintain the unique business model based on design to cost competitiveness and lean distribution. Enhance industrial synergies between Dacia and Lada with CMFB platform and diversity reduction. Reinforce brand identities for each brand. Expand lineup in C segment and increase average price. To sum up, Lada is rough and tough from Russia to the world, and the Dacia brand is the best value proposition in its segment, still with a touch of coolness and outdoor flavor. Tout simplement. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to present you Alpine. The Renault Group has an amazing sports legacy. Countless beautiful stories, gripping finish lines, memorable victories and podiums. From blue berlinettes to yellow teapots, each with their own crowd of cheering fans. Part lies in the global spotlight of motorsports, part in a more confidential niche sports brand. The new Alpine division will bring it all together. Legacy and Future, Trucks and Roads, F1 and A110, and reignite it all with high-tech excellence and passion for racing. Welcome to Alpine, the avant-garde brand of the group. Alpine will combine assets once seen as cost centers with an uncertain future into a fully-fledged new generation business unit developing exclusive, innovative sports cars. Let's look at the three ingredients composing our core DNA. First, Alpine, a true brand with heritage and pedigree. Arguably the epitome of French motoring, building its reputation on remarkable victories along breathtaking racing stages. But a brand would be nothing without the people building its products. As such, Alpine is also a factory, packed with high-end craftsmanship and savoir-faire, as we say in Dieppe. Second, Renault Sport a team of 300 engineering wizards dedicated to special assignments, mastering the entire sports car development from design to after sale. They gave us countless iconic products, such as R5 Turbo, Clio V6, Megan RS Trophy, the list is long. They're also behind the revival of A110. Third and last, but not least, Formula One. Our F1 team gathers 1,200 spearheading clock masters, developing the grand complication watches of motorsports. Elite engineers trained to compete against the most aspirational and highly funded constructors. F1 is also a considerable marketing platform with half a billion fans worldwide, a unique opportunity for global branding. By bringing together the credibility of an authentic brand, specialized manufacturing, engineering mastery and significant media exposure, we set the foundations to truly create market value around Alpine and take it into a different league. This core of key assets will be further strengthened by leveraging a solid environment. Alpine can lean on the skill and capabilities of the Renault Group and the Alliance, tapping into a rich pool of existing resources, such as leaning edge technology, including the Alliance EV native platform, offering best-in-class EV performance top-notch production facilities, and a powerful purchasing arm, ensuring optimum cost competitiveness, and need even thousand strong dealership network worldwide, and the array of RCI financial services, offering the potential to multiply hundredfold the distribution of Alpine. All of this will provide strong basis and immediate levers to the new business model. But above all, it's from within, that this newly formed division will extract the necessary spirit and additional value to switch gears. Building on F1 expertise and technologies, we will inject cutting-edge features in all Alpine products. On the track, every kilowatt of power is paramount. Energy management is a skill we've honed for more than a decade. Taking this expertise to Alpine cars, we will deliver highly efficient electric powertrains, 
seamlessly connected to the road and the grid for best-in-class experience. On the track, time is of the essence. Data must not only be swiftly exchanged, but also rapidly analyzed and processed. F1 know-how will translate into state-of-the-art connectivity solutions, but also turn Alpines into intelligent machines, learning patterns to adjust behavior to routine commutes or sporty runs. More than ever, the future of Alpine is electric. We leverage the Alliance EV platforms to launch a B-segment hot hatch and a C-segment crossover, 100% electric. And we will team up with another legendary brand to imagine the future A110, electric, of course. Together with Lotus, we will develop the next generation of EV sports cars. These exclusive future-ready products are meant for discerning, passionate early adopters. And with this exciting lineup we call our dream garage, the story becomes real. By now, there should be no doubt that racing in general, and F1 in particular, will remain at the heart of our brand. We've renewed our full F1 commitment and will enter the new regulations era in 2022 with the objective of consistently contending for podiums. 2021 will be a transition year for us like for all teams, but the climb towards the summit has already begun and will proudly defend the Alpine team colors with our very own Alpine racers. I'm very proud to show you for the first time iPhone car for this season. Stay tuned. We'll unveil the delivery of the newly minted A521 next month. To wrap it up, the new Alpine is the story of three brands and four entities all merging into one to create an invaluable asset. We'll be agile, smart, and opportunistic, leveraging the best of the Renault Group and the Alliance and teaming up with partners to go even further. Our goal is to be profitable by 2025, including investment in motorsports. We'll move from nostalgia to avant-garde by offering an exclusive, authentic lineup made of high-performance EV sports cars for everyday driving. Thank you. Let's now move beyond automotive. Mobilize is a brand on a mission. Embracing disruption will help solve three major challenges of the auto industry. First, the gap between usage and cost. People pay 100, but use only 10. Second, the rapid loss of asset value. We will fight against a residual value dictatorship, the one imposing that new vehicle value should drop by over 50% after three years, independently from product physical obsolescence. Third, emission. In Europe, the auto industry weights about 15% of the CO2 global emission. We strive here for a zero impact. Why are we embarking on this mission? Because many customers are expecting more from automakers. They move away from consumerism and wish for responsible, efficient, clean solutions. As a car maker, we have all the assets and expertise to choose the role we want to play in the new car usage. We'll transform this disruption into opportunity for profitability. Beyond the core auto industry, we'll capture new growth territory. The value chain is evolving quickly. 
value pools are shifting up towards moving to mobility, energy, and data services. All in all, these three value pools will grow by 40% from 2019 to 2030 to a total of over 370 billion euro in Europe alone. This will be the playing field of Mobilize. Why will we succeed? Because we have unique assets and a smart business approach to leverage them. First, we know how to make cars, more than cars, purpose-designed vehicles meant for mobility services. Second, we know how to do business with those cars beyond selling them. AirCI can offer a wide array of solutions. Third, we will provide data, AI and mobility software platforms and best-in-class onboard connected services. Beyond digital, we can extend our service offering and geographical reach thanks to our unique network of physical touch points with 6,000 dealerships in Europe alone. In addition, we can leverage the refactory in Flin to extend vehicle and battery life. On top of these assets, we created a dedicated, agile business unit. Mobilize will have its own engineering and design teams, its own service offer in energy, data and mobility. It will also benefit from Renault Venture to work with startups. Now, how will we create value for all stakeholders? First, as mentioned, our purpose design vehicles will be engineered for mobility services. Their robustness, lightness, modularity will optimize their operating cost and being electric will enable them to access cities anytime, anywhere. Let's take an example. The car sharing service Ziti in Madrid, operating on Zoe, was roughly break even before COVID-19. It was a successful mix of using algorithm and leveraging Renault dealers. Imagine the impact of using Spring, which is twice as cheap. In average, we aim at reducing operating costs by a minimum of 20%. Second, we'll make fleet acquisition easier. The financial services provided by RCI will allow fleet operators to subscribe, lease or pay per use. This way, fleet ownership costs can become variable. Smartly financed fleet operation can turn into an asset light model. Third, we will increase use car usage thanks to our dedicated mobility, data and AI platforms. We leverage the Renault software factory, the Software République, and partners to develop leading-edge algorithm and data processing software. This will allow better prediction of users' demand and better allocation of vehicles. We aim at increasing the rate of car use by at least 20%. Finally, we'll offer maintenance and recycling services for car-sharing fleets. And when our vehicles are no longer fit for use, we have a sustainable solution. End of light for an electric vehicle does not mean end of value. At the refactory, we can recycle used electric batteries by giving them a second life as a stationary source of energy. This will generate at least a thousand euro per battery. Let's now take a sneak peek at our cards up our sleeve. This lineup is adapted to the most critical new mobility needs. Car sharing, ride hailing, last mile delivery. And, when, and we're also working on on-demand transit. Let's start with our ACE, Easy One. Easy One is a snappy two-seater, fit for end users, operators, cities, you name it. Cost efficiency meets durability. Easy One zooms around, single or dual. It's electric and modular. The rear seat can turn into a trunk. Its exchangeable batteries will make it independent from public infrastructure. Made out of 50% of recycling materials, it will aim to be 95% recyclable. On to the King. The King is the latest Dacia revolution. All electric, lean and affordable. That's the best cost of ownership operators can get for four-seater. And like all Dacia vehicles, it's robust, practical and focused on the essential. The Queen. The Queen is entirely designed and developed for right hailing. It has an autonomy range above 400 kilometers. It will offer best-in-class roominess and comfort, 
which is 4.6 meter length and 1.8 meters width. Finally, the jack of all trades. The vehicle we draw on our concept car is Eflex. Its last mile delivery solution is agile and practical with an innovative loading and unloading module. And its cabin is especially designed for high intensity door to door delivery. This is our hand of cards to win the mobility services game. Now let's see what an ace on wheel can do. In conclusion, Mobilize will provide access to vehicles and mobility services directly to end users through corporates and cities. We'll offer a unique combination of hardware and software, dedicated vehicles and leading edge services. We'll build on an integrated and seamless client experience on board and off board. We we'll leverage our proprietary data from connected vehicles and mobility services will benefit from our ecosystem of partners and startups. Tomorrow, by offering access to cars from one minute to a lifetime, we will create a unique value proposition for end users. Our turnkey solutions, including fleet financing, ride hailing, car sharing and energy services, will also create unique value proposition for operators and public authorities. All in all, Mobilize aim at contributing more than 20% to group turnover in 2030. Thank you. Let me take back my CFO hat with my usual bias, under promise, over deliver. Let's be clear, the revolution marks a new beginning for the group. In order to illustrate how we will exceed 3% operating profit by 2023, we, ha we have split the impact coming from external factors and the one depending on us. We're not betting on a strong recovery after the exceptional 2020 situation. But even though this visibility remains limited, we expect around 25% increase in our main markets in the new three years versus 2020. The season bar shows the main external factors like raw material, forex, and the non-recurring cost reduction related to the 2020 lockdown. We also have in this bar the provision we have accounted for in order to cover unexpected risk. The next bar is what we expect from our commercial performance and sales to partner. The impact is negative because our focus is no longer on volume and sales to partner's assumptions are based only on the existing contracts. Therefore, the chart does not reflect any potential new business upside. Cost reduction will be the strongest lever for our margin improvement. As I already told you, part of the cash cost reduction is not helping the P&L, as the lower capitalization ratio and the increase in depreciation will limit the P&L improvement. The second major lever is the mix price enrichment. Beyond the pricing policy, the mix will increase as we have a clear ambition to do better business rather than more business. Enrichment will come from the required electrification of our lineup 
But even after this cost, this bar should be a strong positive. The last bar is the increased contribution of Aftovaz and RCI. Here as well, we have been prudent when setting the assumption. We told you that cash generation was our top priority. The cumulative cash flow from 2021 to 2023 is going to more than cover our investments. This will be the consequence of the improved cash profitability and lower investment. I must add that the cash flow assumption includes a dividend payment from RCI to the auto business. And as you know, the timing of this payment is subject to European Central Bank decision. The working capital improvement should generate some cash inflow, sufficient cash inflow, to the same tune as a restructuring outflow for the period under review. But we have not factored in a strong working capital inflow as once again we base this plan on the quality of the business and not on volume. We will keep our investment in R&D under control. First, because we've passed the peak and invested in the most advanced technology to comply with ever stricter regulation. The investment may not have been the wisest, but at least now we have good assets to build on. The se second, because we made decision to stop programs that were too expensive to provide a good return. R&D costs should decrease from about 11% of revenue to below 8% by 2025, thanks to a clear focus on Rochi and much lower diversity and complexity. At the end of H1 2020, despite the COVID impact, we had 16.8 billion cash in hand and confirmed credit lines, including 5 billion euro state guaranteed credit line. During Q3, We have drawn down 3 billion of this facility and then another 1 billion in December. The reason why we have decided to use an additional tranche is that this facility was to disappear at the end of 2020. And given all the uncertainties with the pandemic, we thought it was wise to increase our war chest. The reimbursement schedule that you see on the chart does not include the redemption on this credit facility, as we want to keep the benefit of its relatively flexible reimbursement term. But in any case, we'll keep our liquidity reserves, including the confirmed credit lines, at a minimum of 20% of our revenues. As you see, our destination is a place where the operating margin will be at least 5%, with a total cumulative free cash flow of 6 billion euros between 2021 and 2025, and finally, an improved Rossi by more than 15 points. And I think this guidance confirms the turnaround underway in the company. Thank you, and back to Luca. I would like to take a minute uh, to comment this uh, turnaround roadmap. Uh, a minimum of 5% of operational margin might seem a lack uh, warm uh, ambition. First, let's not forget where we come from. A little over a year ago, before COVID hit, our results started to deteriorate with the, an automotive operating margin down to 1.3% in H2 2019. Last summer, we reported a negative operational margin of uh, 1.2 billion uh, euros, and uh, a negative free cash flow of 6.3 billion euros. Second, our numbers are bottom-up and rock-solid. Our assumptions are cautious. We did not bet on any market or partnership upside, as Clotilde said. Third, this financial performance will be the consequence of a profound transformation of our operations. We've set the basics steady, healthy, sound foundations for a sustainable performance. To do so, we have done more than just resizing and cutting excessive costs. We streamlined our organization with a purpose in mind. We have stopped programs, initiated new ones, and reallocated our capital wisely. We concentrated our efforts on highly efficient, modular, multi-energy and full electric platforms. 80% of our production will be based on them. One single family of ICE powertrains will keep all pa our passenger cars. We push the boundaries on variable cost reduction, embarking 
our top suppliers with us. Together with our efforts on pricing and sales mix, this will allow us to face the regulation-induced variable cost peak and still be profitable. These cost reduction efforts don't just aim at downsizing Renault. They aim at turning Renault into a leaner company ready to grow again. This leads to a stronger operational resilience with a break-even point lowered by 30% and more. And that's only the beginning. Meanwhile, we'll build an in-house capacity to face more regulatory challenges, innovate and offer competitive tech-infused smart vehicles. This in-house capacity is supported by brick and mortar assets like the Electropole, the Software Republic and the Refactory. It also supported by new skills and expertise from the AI data specialists, microelectronics and software engineers. This in-house capacity will be the foundation on which we will build our own business within and beyond traditional automotive value chain. It is very clear to all of us that today we are a car maker integrating tech, but tomorrow we want to become a tech company integrating vehicles. And we have already started the journey. Before ending this presentation, let me say three last thanks. First, I would like to hand over the stage to my dear colleagues and partners, Uchida-san, CEO of Nissan Motor, and Kato-san, CEO of Mitsubishi Motors. I have presented them our strategic plan. They could not be with us today, but they did it the kindness of to say a few words. Thank you, Luca. Hello, everyone. Today is an important day for Group Renault. I'm sure their strategic plan, Renault turns a new page for them. On behalf of Nissan, let me take this opportunity to express my view. In summary, I believe Renault is a well laid out business strategy, taking into consideration the current ongoing macro and industry trends, but also with an aggressive vision towards the future. I'd like to first congratulate Luca and the whole team under his leadership in crafting this strong plan towards Reynolds' revolution. When Luca shared this plan with me, I felt strong resonance with Nissan Next, our business transformation plan. With a clear focus on repositioning, I believe that Renolution's concentration on brands and key segment while balancing product portfolio will help them deliver clear value and move them beyond automotive. This definitely complements Nissan's approach to beyond mobility and driving innovation. In May 2020, Nissan announced Nissan Next that aims to return the company to a growth path and re-establish our foundation to compete in the coming decade. And currently, it is progressing well. Our alliance partner, Mitsubishi Motors, is also progressing on their recently announced midterm business plan, Small But Beautiful. Together with today's revolution, each company's plan is designed to capitalize on the asset within the alliance. We all share common interest and are all aggressively positioning ourselves in connected autonomous and education area. As Luca mentioned in his presentation, the complementary and collaborative nature of our business plans makes me very confident of the opportunity the Alliance presents. We all need to be prepared to face a very challenging business environment ahead of us, a challenging environment that we have never seen. In order for us to remain in this race, each partner company will need to focus on their individual ambitions, capitalize on their strengths, enhancing our competitiveness, and at the same time, collaborate more closely among partners to support mutual growth. It is critical that the three companies further enhance their combined strengths. On a final note, I'm looking forward to seeing 
Renault back on the path to long-term growth under the leadership of Luca. Nissan will also do its best. Please count on us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Takao Kato, CEO of Mitsubishi Motors. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make a comment on Renault's new strategic plan, Renault-Lution, developed by Luca and the colleagues of Renault. After hearing Luca's impressive presentation, I'm more confident that Renault can achieve the goals of this challenging but dynamic plan, which leads Renault to realize further growth. In July 2020, Mitsubishi Motors announced our three-year midterm business plan, Small But Beautiful. Renolution and Nissan Next both resonate well with our plan, helping us pursue value rather than scale or volume. I believe Renault's three-step approach to 2030 allows for agility to adapt and evolve to the many uncertainty we face today. Mitsubishi Motors is now focusing on completing our structural reforms and further strengthening our competitive areas. I am glad to see a similar synergetic approach in Renault's plan. The current plan allows for many areas of collaboration among the alliance partners and leverage collaboration as Renault strengthen their position in Europe, Nissan pursue their core market strategy in the US and China while MMC concentrate on ASEAN. As I said, the world has been facing with very difficult situation and it is going to continue for a while. However, I believe that we, Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi Motors can overcome this tough situation and achieve our future plans by holding hands together. Thank you, and all the best to Luca and all colleagues of Renault. Thank you, Chia-san. Thank you, Kato-san. Arigato gozaimasu. Uh, I know you are watching us from Yokohama and uh, Tokyo. Your support is most uh, valuable to, to us. I also want to take this opportunity to, to thank the Renault board for their contribution and support. And second thing I wanted to say uh, is that uh, electrification is only one pillar of our CSR strategy. As a leader in this industry, Renault has an ambitious CSR plan, which will be unveiled at the General Assembly in April, along with our new uh, corporate uh, purpose. I, I can already tell you that our CSR plan will be bold and revolve around three main topics, environment, safety, and inclusion. Finally, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your support in general in these uh, tough times. Thank you for your attention on this uh, very intense uh, uh, 90 minutes. Uh, a special thanks goes to the people, all the people that contributed to develop the plan and organize this uh, event. Even though some of the ingredients were already in the house, most of these projects have been created and activated in the last six months. It tells you about the speed and energy moving our employees in this time of crisis. The Renault people want their company moving away from the state in which it has been recently. Imagine what might happen if we continue with that level of dynamism for the next six years. A particular thanks goes to the 40 colleagues of the source. You see them on the screen, the team that helped the board of management feed and structure the plan. Our team has put all its energy in it. And the most important thing for me is that Renolution is Renault people's plan. Seeing what I've seen, the project, the team, the leaders, 
I am now, after six months, very optimistic that we will turn this company around and succeed. So thank you very much. We will open now, after a few, a small preparation to uh, your question in a few minutes.